Hi, uh, I'm happy to be here today to tell you uh, about a lot of the sort of general take homes and learnings from research on the psychology of misinformation. Uh, before I get into the details, I just want to give you a little bit of an understanding of the methodology uh, where these findings come from are mostly from survey experiments in which people are presented with headlines often in the format of Facebook posts and asked to either judge their accuracy um, or in other things to say whether they would share them or not. Um, but I wanna focus here on accuracy. And then you look at uh, what different elements predicts people's responses and predicts how well they uh, can tell true headlines from false headlines. And in general, the different uh, factors can be broken down into two different types uh, of uh, relationships. The first one is factors that tend to increase belief in content regardless of whether it's true or not. So it makes people believe things more, believe true things more and believe false things more. It's just general signals that people use uh, as, um, as, as markers of uh, truth. One of, of the core idea here is repetition. Um, it's this finding that's been shown in cognitive psychology for decades that when a claim is repeated, when you see a claim repeatedly, it makes you believe it more. Um, and we showed that this was true even if it's totally outlandish. So these kind of really blatantly fake news stories from the 2016 uh, election in the US, for example, we found that you know, showing people these stories made them subsequently believe them more. And it was true even if you didn't want to believe the claim. So in our experiments, even uh, people reading claims that supported the other side, for example, you could think about Hillary Clinton supporters reading lies about Clinton during the 2016 election, just seeing those false statements uh, repeatedly makes them seem more true. And also, this is the case, even if you're someone that is smart and engages with a lot of critical thinking, we found that cognitive sophistication doesn't protect you from uh, these kinds of repetition effects. Uh, so, you know, repetition is really powerful. It operates at a low level of cognition. And so it's really hard to counteract. Uh, another factor that increases belief in content, regardless of whether it's true or not, is being consistent with what you already believe. So for example, uh, in the context of politics, people are more likely to believe claims that align with their politics than claims that don't. Um, and people often see this as a sign of motivated reasoning. That is the idea that you know, people's reasoning abilities are captured by their motivations. For example, they're part of it, their partisan motivations. Um, but that's not necessarily true. It could just be that partisans have different factual beliefs. That is, if one person watches Fox News and gets all their information from Fox News, another person gets all their information from MSNBC, then even if they were totally rational, unbiased, you know, uh, reasoners, they would come to have very different uh, factual understandings of the world, um, and therefore. Uh, to treat new information differently. And in fact, it can be rational to disbelieve information that, predict, that contradicts your prior knowledge when there's uncertainty about the source. So if somebody tells you something that's, to that's totally inconsistent with everything else you believe about the world, it's actually reasonable to conclude that probably they don't know uh, what's going on rather than that everything that you believe about the world is wrong. And so this means the fact that people are more likely to believe things that are consistent with what they already know isn't necessarily a sign that people are uh, being irrational. It could just be that, you know, there's uncertainty about sources. And so, either, you know, uh, co belief coherence is a reasonable way to understand the world. And this, uh, you know, segues to a third major a uh, way to promote belief, which is to have the information come from a trusted source. Um, people tend to believe information from trusted sources more than non-trusted sources, and political elites are a particularly important example of this because they are people that are trusted uh, in general by their supporters. Um, they have substantial influence on the beliefs of their supporters, and they also have big platforms. So they have the ability to reach uh, large numbers of people. Again, the fact that, uh, that followers are influenced by the positions taken by their, uh, the elites of their party isn't necessarily motivated reasoning. It could just be that, you know, if I know that in general, I agree with Biden on many things, or in general, I agree with Trump on many things, then if there's some new uh, issue that I don't know that much about, it can actually be a reasonable heuristic to say, well, uh, I guess if he says it's good, then it's probably good. Or if he says it's bad, it's probably bad. And also, you know, 
although these signals from elites are powerful, they're not, um, you know, they're not totally intractable. We have research that shows that counter arguments and evidence can counteract messaging from elites. And in fact, the, the messages are just as effective even when there is a countervailing elite a message. So just because you know elite says something doesn't mean it's set in stone. Um, if you if followers are exposed to uh, sort of corrective evidence that should adjust their beliefs, but the problem is that people are just much less likely to be exposed to uncongenial evidence. Um, you know, if there's if there is a position, say like a false position that the elites in their party are taking, they're much more likely to be ex ex repeatedly exposed to the false claims of the elites uh, than they are to be exposed to the actually uncongenial but correct information. And so I think that uh, you know this is what makes certain kinds of propaganda campaigns or coordinated misinformation campaigns by elites so are powerful is they have big platforms and their trusted sources. Uh, and so I think this is like a major issue in the misinformation space uh, that we and others are grappling with. Okay, so if those are factors that will make you more likely to believe something regardless of whether it's true or not, <clears throat> it's also interesting to ask what are factors that selectively believe, uh, increase belief in falsehood? That is factors that make you worse at telling truth from falsehood. Uh, and what we've found in a bunch of different research, re research is just like lack of reasoning or lack of critical thinking uh, makes people sort of selectively vulnerable to false claims. So people who are more likely to just go with their gut and not stop and think are more likely to believe false claims, regardless of whether those claims align with their politics or not. Uh, we found this in a big cross-cultural study or set of different studies, actually. We've consistently observed this pattern, including in the Ukraine, but in, in, in one paper and another paper, we did 16 countries on six continents. Um, we find this consistent pattern. Uh, and in particular, people that engage in more thinking are more likely to judge new evidence by uh, their prior knowledge, which in general leads them in the right direction, but not necessarily if you have a set of beliefs that have gotten really uh, corrupted, that if you're sort of already down the rabbit hole, as it were, that engaging in more reasoning is just gonna lead you to confirm uh, the rabbit hole positions. But in general, uh, reasoning is good. And uh, a consequence of this is that if people are just are distracted, for example, as they often are on social media where news is mixed in with, you know, baby pictures and cat videos and stuff like that, it makes them uh, selectively more likely <clears throat> to believe false claims. And similarly, <clears throat> when people rely on emotion or if they're induced to be more emotional, that also makes them more susceptible to false claims. Uh, another factor that it leads you people to be selectively vulnerable to falsehoods is a lack of digital or media literacy. We found that familiarity with internet related terms, knowledge of how the uh, Facebook newsfeed works and general knowledge about how news is produced. All of these are associated with uh, being better at telling true from falsehood. Um, and this kind of uh, relationship with literacy is independent from critical thinking or from general education level. Um, so these are sort of separate paths to uh, distinguishing truth from falsehood. And there's evidence from experiments that literacy trainings or literacy tips can help people tell truth from falsehood, although uh, they're not all literacy trainings are created equally. And so it's really important to actually do testing and understand which ones work and which ones don't. So putting this together, there are factors that make people more likely to believe uh, content regardless of whether it's true or false, which includes repetition, alignment with political or factual beliefs, and coming from trusted or elite sources. And then there are also things that make people specifically vulnerable to falsehoods, uh, which can create a lack of reasoning or critical thinking and lack of digital media literacy. Okay, so if these are the things that predict uh, why people believe uh, claims, or particularly false claims, then there's also a question of what can be done to try to counteract misinformation. One big take home is that warnings, labels, and corrections, debunking, it totally works. Don't worry about backfire effects. It's just not a thing. Like if you correct people that will in general, or if you issue corrections that will in general make people believe content more. Uh, and there, you know, this idea that people will dig in and it'll make them 
uh, engage in motivated reasoning and make them believe things even more. It's just not really uh, true. So <clears throat> two corrections and warnings. It also doesn't matter that much how the, de the details of how the corrections are done, just like corrective information tends to correct somewhat. It's not you know perfect, but it shifts people in the right directions. And the main challenge for, for warnings and debunking is just uh, scalability. There's such a large number of claims out there that it's really hard to fact check everything and it's hard to get the debunks uh, to everything and it's also hard to have the debunks or the corrections reach the people uh, that need correction and this is actually a place where social media I think can play a, a positive role in terms of getting corrections uh, to people. But even with that, you need to be able to, to fact check large quantities of content. Um, and so what we've shown is that the wisdom of crowds is actually a way that you can help identify bad content at scale. Obviously, we wouldn't trust the, just, trust the judgment of any random person, but there's tons of evidence that crowds, uh, if you average the ratings of a bunch of people, it actually can do a good job of uh, approximating expert judgment. And we've showed that crowds of 20 or fewer people just uh, you know, rating headlines and leads of sentences can of, of news stories can generate as much agreement with professional fact checkers as the fact checkers have with each other. Again, this is something we've replicated cross-culturally. And so, uh, you know, this gives you a scalable way of identifying bad con uh, content. And that's something that social media platforms could do. And then they could use these layperson signals to either label content as prob potentially problematic or to downrun content such that people are just like less, less likely to see it uh, in the first place. Uh, and finally, uh, another thing that can be done in a scalable way is uh, just shifting people's attention to the concept of accuracy. We've done research which shows that most people do not want to share misinformation, but on social media, uh, their attention is typically directed to other things such that they forget to even consider accuracy when they're deciding what to share. And we've showed that it's easy uh, to just nudge people to think about the concept of accuracy again. For example, we've shown that if you just say, here's a random post, you know, help us inform our algorithms, how accurate is this post that activates the concept of accuracy in their mind, providing minimal digital literacy tips does the same thing. And then that causes people to increase the quality of the news they share because they're more likely to stop and think, oh, is this accurate before they share it. We've shown that it's effective across a number of different countries. We've also showed that it works in a large scale, scale Twitter field experiment. where We found people that were actually sharing misinformation on Twitter and sent them a little message getting them to think about accuracy and it improved the quality of what they shared afterwards. And so the implication of this is that social media platforms can get people uh, to pay attention to accuracy. They're very good at getting people to pay attention to ads and they can use some of that muscle to get people to also attend to accuracy when they're deciding what to share. And you know, a broader point is when you're thinking about uh, interventions, um, any kind of intervention that you're gonna do on social media, attention is key. And so if you design some five minute video that is a great training video, that's basically gonna be useless because nobody is gonna watch it. Um, and so you really have to remember, you have people's attention for a very small amount of time on social media. And so any kind of intervention really has to capitalize on uh, attention. Finally, although social media has borne the vast amount of the criticism around misinformation, it's not the only channel, and I would argue it's probably not the biggest channel for misinformation, but instead, political elites and the mainstream media play a huge part in the uh, creation and dissemination of misinformation, and they often get a free pass, and so it's really important to also hold these sort of more traditional information sources accountable. Um, and I would say as my sort of summary take home of all of this, uh, increasing exposure to accurate or corrective information can really make a difference. It's not the case that we're in some post-truth era where people just don't care about facts or information at all. It's that more that people just are not getting exposed to good information, um, particularly some people. Uh, and so doing what we can to increase exposure to good information, I think, really is a key uh, general intervention. So uh, thanks very much uh, and uh, looking forward to discussion. Um, and you know, if people want to learn more about this stuff, uh, these are a bunch of different sources of information you can uh, look more into. Thanks very much, take care.